Good morning, everyone. Welcome to everyone who has joined us on site. And we also want to welcome those of you who are joining us via our online campus. We're thrilled that you are here today. Uh, uh, today, I conclude the series Marathon. And if, if you have, uh, there have been five, series in, you know, five sermons, including today's sermon in this series. And if you didn't watch them, there's no way I can review them all for you this morning. I would just encourage you to go to our website and, and listen to them. You say, well, Pastor Barry, you're, a, you're kind of a long preacher, so I'm not sure I have that much time. I will tell you that this series, I've preached shorter messages than ever in the last uh, 15 years of my ministry here, so you have time. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I say this about every series that I give birth to. Um, this one is my favorite. <laughs> I know I say that about everyone, but it's true. This series is my favorite. Uh, last week, we talked about hitting the wall. In the marathon, all marathon runners understand what it means to hit the wall. We saw that in the marathon that is our faith race, everyone eventually hits a wall. The wall for the Christian is the place where you come to the end of your physical, mental, emotional, and or spiritual strength. It's the wall, when you hit the wall. The wall is conquered, we saw last week, when we run in the power and uh, run in the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we saw that many Bible people, I think I identified just nine of them, many Bible people hit a wall in their faith race. And we learned some lessons about how to conquer and get past and scale the wall when you hit the wall. Today we're going to end this series by talking about how to end a marathon. How to end a marathon. Uh, and so, so maybe you're sitting there this morning and you're saying, well, Pastor Barry, I'm young. You're old, I'm young. <laughs> a, couple, uh, a couple days ago I turned 62 and I do feel old. In fact, uh, uh, scholars tell us that Paul was about 60 to 61 years old when he died, the Apostle Paul. So I've outlived the Apostle Paul. I feel like an OG, the original OG, you know, the old guy. Uh, and so you're sitting there, maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, well, Pastor Barry, I'm young. I'm, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to talk about the end, you know, end of my life or finishing my marathon. i got plenty of miles to go. And let me just say right at the top of this message, how you run your race in your early years will determine whether you finish or not. Think about it. You, if you're young... Young in age, young in your walk with the Lord, how the habits that you develop now, the decisions that you have now, make now the convictions that you have now will determine how well you finish the race in years to come. We're going to talk about that this morning, how to end a marathon, how to run now so that you can finish the marathon. And the Apostle Paul in our two texts Today, by the way, if you have your Bibles, and you should, turn with me to Acts chapter 20 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, two texts today. I'm going to send you through your paces today. Uh, two texts. Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 27, and 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6 through 8. The Apostle Paul, in both of these two texts, shows us by example how to finish a marathon well. In fact, let me just say it before we even read these texts, because I want you to pay attention to this as we read these Bible texts this morning. Paul the Apostle seems to be obsessed, literally obsessed with how he's going to finish his race. And I think that's an example to us, and I want us to end the series by being inspired by Paul and his determination to end his race well. Stand with me and let's read, begin by reading Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 27. By the way, both of these texts deal with the Apostle Paul. We're going to look at how, how, they, how they fit in, but be, let's begin with Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 27. Luke is writing here, and he says, and now, and Paul, Luke is writing, but he's quoting Paul. Here, okay? Luke is writing this, but he's quoting Paul. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. 
I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Okay, you see his focus there on the race and how he ends his race. Now let's flip over to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of God. Can you say amen? Amen. Father, teach us out of your word today. May we be inspired by it. May we uh, be motivated to obey it. Not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today's message is titled, Finishing Well. Finishing Well. Let me just talk very quickly and briefly about some uh, significant points of contextual consideration. What is going on in these texts, how they relate to one another, and how they affect this idea of our faith race being a marathon. First of all, I want to make this point. Both texts, the Acts chapter 20 and the 2 Timothy 4 text, are farewell texts. Paul believes in both of these texts. You read them clearly. Paul believes that his death is imminent. In both of these texts, the Acts chapter 20 and the 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul believes that his Death is imminent. I, re- I want you to recall in the Acts chapter 20 text, he says, my life means nothing to me now. I'm warned in every city I go to as I go to Jerusalem, hardship and prison faces me, and whatever happens, I'm ready to go. In fact, if you, if you read a little bit farther in the text of Acts chapter 20, he says to these people he's talking to, you're not going to see me anymore. This is it. This is the last time I'm going to lay eyes on you. You will see me no more. So say your goodbyes because this is it. In both of these texts, he thinks that his death is imminent. Acts is Luke's account of Paul's farewell to the Ephesians. He calls the elders from Ephesus over to where he is, and he gives them his farewell address. Now, He spent more time in Ephesus than anywhere. He knew most of the the church in Ephesus, so they were like some of his closest friends and associates. And so when he wanted to say goodbye, you know, he wanted to gather all of his close friends together. By the way, let me just say this. Even though Paul thinks he's going to die when he goes to Jerusalem, he doesn't. (laughs) There are several more years that Paul lives. Now, he is arrested in Jerusalem, and he is eventually shipped to Rome, where he is imprisoned twice and eventually dies a martyr's death in Rome. But even though he thinks he's going to die, and he tells the Ephesians elders, you're not going to see me anymore, this is it, I'm done. The fact is, it wasn't. It was several years before he died, and I think that's interesting. You say, "Well, well, well, that doesn't make sense. Sure it does. Sure it does. Paul lived his life as if he was going to die at any time. And he's like, my life means any, nothing to me. Come and get me. I don't care. I, I'm not living for this world for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. That was Paul's message, okay? The Second Timothy text is Paul's farewell address to his protege, his successor, Timothy. And by the way, this actually is the one. These are the last words of the Apostle Paul from 2 Timothy. He's in prison in in a jail cell in Rome, the Mamertine prison. I've had the privilege of being there. I tried to dig out a picture to show you. I've been in the exact cell where Paul was uh, 
put in prison, and, and it's cold and it's wet down there, and it's kind of moldy, and it's from there that Paul says to Timothy, when you come to me, and please come quickly, bring my coat. When I was down in that prison cell, I was like, wow, I could use a coat right now too. Imagine Paul living down here. So, so this is, in fact, the place where Paul was martyred. He was soon martyred by Nero in about 64 AD, around the year 64 AD. Tradition tells us he was beheaded by Nero in 64 AD. So both of these texts, Paul believes his death is imminent, and that's important. He sees the marathon of his life coming to an end. The second contextual significant point I want to make this morning, number two, is that rather than being tormented by his impending death, Paul seems obsessed with how he will finish his life. I find this interesting. Paul had no fear of death. He did not fear death in any way, shape, or form. If he feared anything, he feared that he might die before he finished his, what God had called him to do. So rather than being tormented by his impending death, Paul seems obsessed with how he will finish his life. In fact, he, he, he like completely ignores how he's going to die. His dominant concern is about completing the work to which God has called him. That's his dominant concern. And you can see that in both of these scriptures, Acts 20, verse 24, however I consider my, worth, my life worth nothing to me, only, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. That's my only aim, is to finish the race and complete the task. Finish my marathon and complete the task. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And basically he's saying, now I can die because I know I've finished well. I've done what I set out to do. I've completed the task that God has given me. So Paul doesn't fear death. If anything, he fears not finishing well. I wonder how many of us just fat, flat, flat, we, we fear death. That's, that's, that's what we're obsessed with. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. You say, well, isn't that normal, Pastor Barry? Um, yes, I think there should be a normal concern. We should not we throw our lives away needlessly. But for the true child of God, death is not something that we should fear, we should be terrorized of. But rather, like the Apostle Paul, I believe if we should fear anything, it's, it's that we don't finish well. It's one thing, listen to me, it's one thing to finish the race, it's another thing to finish well. There's a distinction there that Paul talks about. And so the, Paul, the Apostle Paul's obsession with finishing well should inspire us all. And that's what I want to talk about for the next few moments before we conclude this message and this series. Paul's obsession with finishing well. So the first part of this message, I want to talk about some of Paul's end-of-life convictions. Okay? I want to give you several of Paul's end-of-life convictions. Now, let me just say this, because I know, again, I'm picturing several of you thinking, well, my life is not over yet. I don't plan to die anytime soon. But let me tell you something. No matter where you are in life, no matter where you are in your Christian journey, you should have end-of-life convictions. How you feel, how you are convicted right now, how you live your life right now would determine how well you finish. Okay, so you should, you, you say, well, I plan to live a long time. Yes, and you should live a long time with some of these end-of-life convictions. And so let me touch on several of them that we can just glean and pull straight out of the text. The first end-of-life conviction Paul had, number one, is I will obey the Holy Spirit's leading despite any and every hardship. That was Paul's first, in our text, end-of-life conviction. I will obey the Holy Spirit's leading despite any and every hardship. Look at verse 23 of Acts 20. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Now listen, look at this. Did you see in the text that the Holy Spirit was leading and compelling and warning Paul about the hardships ahead? The Holy Spirit was, 
the Holy Spirit was leading, compelling, and warning Paul about the hardship ahead. Luke writes that Paul knew he was headed to prison. He knew it. But God doesn't say, and I find this interesting, and I think we all should too, that God doesn't say to Paul, don't go there. Do not go to Jerusalem. Prison and hardships await you there. Don't go there. God doesn't say don't go there. I find that interesting, and I think we all should. He says go there in the power and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If you go there, be aware this is going to happen and go there with my leading and with my blessing and in my power. So, uh, so Paul's first end of life conviction that it should inspire us is that I will obey the Holy Spirit's leading despite any and every hardship. Number two, the second end of life conviction Paul has is that I can trust God in the dark. Paul's second end of life conviction. I can trust God in the dark. Look at verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. And look at this. Not knowing what will happen to me there. Now, let me just be honest. I find this difficult. Can I just tell you, my staff knows this. They know this about me. I don't like surprises. I I can't stand surprises. I tell people all the time, if you want to surprise me, don't surprise me. (laughs) Surprise me by my not surprising. I don't like surprises. Why? I like to know what's going to happen because I like to be prepared for it, right? Not many of us in this room, I think it's our culture tells us you don't do anything unless you know what's going to happen. I need an itinerary and I need an agenda ahead of me. And Paul says, I'm going to obey the Holy Spirit wherever he leads, even when he leads me into the unknown. I don't know what's going to happen to me there, but I'm going there because I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit. Now let me just say this, write this down if you're taking notes. God doesn't promise not to lead us into the unknown. He promises to go with us into the unknown. You say, well, God would never lead me into the unknown. Oh, oh, yeah, he would. Look at Psalm 23, verse 4. One of my favorite psalms should be yours too. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It doesn't say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Yea, he will not walk me through the valley of the shadow. No. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow. And some of us were walking through dark and unknown places and were mad at God. How could you lead me here not knowing, for me not knowing where I'm going? How can you lead me here in the dark? God doesn't promise not to lead us into the unknown. He promises to go with us into the unknown. See, friends, listen to me. The unknown is an adventure with God in the lead. What often happens is that, listen, What often happens is that we rush into the unknown and get hurt because God was never leading us there. That's the key. Don't go, oh, 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 I should go into the unknown? Okay, don't go into every unknown. (laughs) No. The key to trusting God in the dark is to be compelled by the Holy Spirit to go there. Okay, so Paul's end of life convictions, number one, I will obey the Holy Spirit's leading despite any and every hardship. Number two, I can trust God in the dark. Number three, my every priority is subordinate to my divine calling. Paul's third, end of life conviction, my every priority is subordinate to my divine calling. Look at verse 24 of Acts 20. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, look at that. Look at the focus. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. That's it. My only aim. That's my only desire. That's my only goal. Every other priority in my life is subordinate to that one. Furthermore, let me just say this, and I find this very interesting. Paul had a single-sentence divine purpose statement. Did you know that? It's right in our text. A single-sentence divine purpose statement. 
Look at verse 24. The Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's my purpose state. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And you could put at the end, to the Gentiles. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Single sentence purpose statement. Everything else in my life, Paul says, is subordinate to that number one top priority, my divine calling. Let me ask you a question as we move on in this message. How committed are you to your divine purpose? How committed to you are you to your divine purpose? Let me just say this. If you don't know your divine purpose, you need to pull out all the stops, do whatever it takes to find your gift, find your purpose, find your divine calling and fulfill. You need to stop at nothing, make everything, because you don't want to stand before God having run your one and only marathon and say, I guess I ran in vain. And by the way, a lot of people cop out and say, well, my number one purpose in life is the raising of my children. And I think that's a grand and wonderful idea. But if, let me just say this, this might seem mean, but trust me, I can back this up with Scripture. You stand before God and all you have to present to Him is your family. Because Jesus said, if you love me, You'll leave your mother, father, husband, wife, children, and follow me. You'll love me more. Some people, their family's it. That's it. That's the whole thing. Paul said, everything in my life is subordinate to my divine calling. How committed are you to your divine purpose? Do you know it? You should know it. Number four, fourth, end of life conviction that Paul makes I have lived a life of no regrets. I have lived a life of no regrets. Look at Acts 20, 26 and 27. Therefore, I declare to you today, (laughs) therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Now remember, Paul is saying goodbye to the elders at Ephesus. He didn't think, he he said, I'm not going to see you anymore. This is it. Say your goodbyes to me, hugs and kisses. I'm out of here and you will see me no more. And by the way, I'm innocent of anybody's blood in this room today. I have no regrets for what I've done or what I've said. No regrets. Here's what Paul is saying. When I stand before God, I will not be ashamed I preached the whole gospel. I warned you. I compelled you. I instructed you. And what I had to, I rebuked you. I did not shrink back. And I have no regrets. Can I tell you this is what I use as my preaching guide? It is my goal that you will never be able to stand in heaven's courts before God and say, nobody told me and I didn't know When you stand before God, will you have regrets? If you do, repent of them now and get to work now. Invest your life in the kingdom of God now, not in your own selfish ambitions and pursuits. Number five, the fifth end-of-life conviction of Paul. I have fought for what I believe fulfilled my calling, and faced up to every trial. I have fought for what I believed, fulfilled my calling, and faced up to every trial. Verse 7, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Listen, I think about a generation of people who are deconstructing their faith when they should be holding fast and fighting for what they believe finding and fulfilling their calling, and facing up to every trial. Let me take a moment and speak to our next-gen leaders, Pastor Patrick Daniels and Ashley. 
God has called you here to Tiffany Fellowship Church for a divine purpose. And so, with boldness and courage, raise up a generation of constructors, not deconstructionists. Call out the students of our church, the youth of our church, to believe in a big God to do big things. Young people, listen to me. Believe and hold fast and stand firm. You serve a big God who can do big things. Don't ever give up on your faith. Start now. Hold fast. Hold strong. Pastor Matt, who will be watching this video tomorrow, God has raised you up for such a time as this to teach our children to know and follow Jesus. And so, with boldness and courage, raise up a generation of children who worship and love and live for Jesus. And as for the rest of us, lead pastor, worship pastor, marriage pastor, small group pastors, we will come alongside and help. But by God's grace, listen to me, let the next gen be the generation that ushers in the return of Jesus. Let the next gen be the gen that sees Jesus coming. And hopefully I'll be standing on the Mount of Olives when it happens. <laughs> I'm going twice this year, so I've just doubled my chances of being there when it happens. <laughs> you hear that word around here, you hear it a lot, Next Gen Ministries. We believe, we're investing, we're investing in the next gen to be the gen that sees the return of Jesus. Six, the last one. Give you the last end of life conviction that Paul has from out of these texts. There, there's a medal at the end of my marathon. Paul ran the race understanding one thing. There's a medal at the end of my marathon. Look at verse 8 of 2 Timothy. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. That is a prize that the runner wins. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the crown, the victor's crown in the marathon race. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, the righteous judge, the judge of the Olympic Games will award to me on that day. Paul says there's a medal at the end of my marathon. Now let me say to everyone here or watching today who are in the trial of your life, because I know you've hit the wall, and I appreciate that a lot of you... Uh, were inspired by and helped by and blessed and ministered to by last week's message. And, and, and there, I know there's a lot of people who've hit the wall. So let me say to everyone here or watching today who are in the trial of your life, hear me, hear me, hear me. Your trial is really a test. Your trial is really a test. And so listen, there's a trophy at the end of your trial. There's a medal at the end of your marathon and a trophy at the end of your trial. Look at James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Stand the test, face up to every trial, persevere to the end. Because when we see Jesus, we want a crown, a medal, a trophy that we can lay at his feet. What will you bring? What will you bring to the feet of the king at the end of the marathon? Now, those are just some end-of-life end of convictions that should inspire us that Paul made. Now, I want to talk for just a few moments about how to follow Paul's example, some practical application of this message. How do we follow Paul's example? How do we practice this? Let me touch on just three things. Number one, the first thing we should all do to finish well is to reframe your perspective on hardship, trials, and the unknown. Reframe your perspective on hardship, trials, and the unknown. And let me stand as a prophet of God this morning and say this, in our culture today, in our world today, it's not going to get easier to serve God. It's going to get harder. 
The church is being come against at every turn by our culture. They're telling us, change your beliefs on abortion. Change your beliefs on, on lifestyle. Change your beliefs on what's sin and not sin. Change your beliefs. Conform to it, or we're going to cancel you. we got to stand firm. It's going to get harder. It's not going to get easier. So we have to reframe our perspective on what that means. Paul said, every city I go to, they're saying I'm going to have to endure prison. And Paul's like, that's fine. I don't value my life. Let's go to prison. We need to stop fearing the unknown. Stop stumbling under trial. Stop failing during hardship. Start reframing everything. Start reframing everything. See, it's not hardship. It's a test. It's not hardship. It's a test. It's not a, tr uh, not a trial. It's a test. It's not unknown. It's a test of trusting God in the dark. It's not the worst. How many times have I heard this? Oh, it's the worst. It's not the worst. It could actually be the best. Reframe your perspective. I've read and I'm reading it again. The Lord just basically spoke to me to read this book. Craig Grishel's new book, he wrote it in 2021, called Winning the War in Your Mind. He talks about reframing your perspective. He writes this, and I quote, Think about some of the worst circumstances you've had to go through. You never would have chosen them, and maybe you prayed God would pull you out of them, but but didn't they help you grow in ways that are crucial to who you are today? Sometimes we need to thank God for what he didn't do. Whoa. Wasn't it the famous theologian, Garth Brooks, who said, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers? <laughs> Reframe your perspective. Focus on the trophy, not the trial. Let me tell you a quick story about myself. Uh, this last week, I endured on Tuesday my eighth kidney procedure. I've had ma two major surgeries and several minor surgeries, and I had my eighth procedure on my kidney this last Tuesday. And I want to tell you something, this, this kidney struggle that I've been going through the last several years has been so discouraging to me. You cannot know. The doctor has adjusted my diet, and finally he told me, if you would just stop eating, we could get rid of these kidney stones. Like, and so after, after seven procedures on my kidneys, within two years, they're back, bilateral kidney stones. And I, I mean, it's been frustrating. And so I asked the doctor about a couple of weeks ago, because he said, we're going we're to have to go in and get him. I'm like, mm. So I said, listen, am I going to have to do this every two years from the rest of my life? Am I going to have to do this every two years from the rest of my life? Because I don't want to do this. So I am reframing my perspective. I'm in the middle of reframing my perspective. Uh, and so here's, what, here's how I'm changing the way I think about this. I have two functioning kidneys. Even though sometimes they have stones, I thank God I have two functioning kidneys. Some people don't have any. I have a great urologist who found them when they were small. I have a church that pays for me to have wonderful health insurance. I was able to teach on Wednesday night the day after the procedure. Now, if you were in that class, I'm not really even sure what I said. I think it was okay. I think it was okay. Was it okay? I mean, I was able to teach on Wednesday after having on Tuesday. And probably... The best reframing of all, listen to this, here's how I'm reframing it. Now I am collecting kidney stone fragments to make into a nice necklace for my wife. <laughs> a trophy necklace for my trophy wife. 
That's awesome. I'm reframing my perspective. By the way, if you want to see him, let me know. I'll show him to you. I'm proud of him. <laughs> Number two, the second way we practice this, not only reframe your perspective on hardship, trials, and the unknown, but number two, discover, develop, and deploy a single sentence divine purpose statement. Now, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Most of you are probably going to ignore this to your detriment. I think one of the most powerful things Paul did was to understand in a single statement what his divine purpose was. And let me tell you something. If if the devil or culture or somebody is telling you that you don't have a divine purpose, they are lying in your spirit. God has called you, shaped you, and given you a divine purpose that no one else can fulfill. It's your calling, and it's your purpose, and you're going to stand before God at the end of time and give an account for it. Paul's was testifying to the good news of God's grace. That was his single sentence purpose statement. And you could tack on the end to the Gentiles. I have one. Would you like to hear it? I have a single sentence, and true to, true to me, it's a long sentence. It's a long sentence. Here it is. My divine calling is to lead and feed Tiffany Fellowship Church into a deeper relationship with Jesus and to preach the gospel to the north land of Kansas City and to the ends of the earth. That, that's, a, that's a big, long sentence, but that's, that's my mission. That's my mission. Let me tell you something. If I despise kidney stones, it's because they might keep me from doing my mission. That's my mission. That's my calling. What is your single sentence divine calling statement? You should have one. God made you and shaped you for a divine purpose. What are you running for? Just to finish, just to get into heaven, don't run in vain. And when you cross the finish line, will you be taking anyone else with you? Number three, musicians, come, let's close the service. Run your faith race like it's the last mile of your marathon. These are ways of following these examples of being inspired by Paul's end-of-life convictions. Run your faith race like it's the last mile of your marathon. Run your faith race with no regrets. Share your faith like it's the last day of your life. Love your wife like she's the only woman on earth. Pray for your kids like they're standing on the doorstep of hell. Give generously to God like it's the last offering to save millions of people. Care for the hurting, the poor, the lost, the unborn like you're the only one who can help. Live like there's no tomorrow. Run across the finish line with nothing left in your tank. Leave it all on the race course. Take the crown at the end of the race, the trophy at the end of the trial, the medal at the end of the marathon, and place it at Jesus' feet. He, and he alone, is worthy of the full investment of your life. Don't just finish. Don't just finish. Finish well. Finish well. Let's conclude. (laughs) That's it, I've said it all. Whew. I want to conclude this series in two ways. Will you stand with me this morning? I don't do this a lot, but every once in a while I do it, and I think this is so important as we conclude this series. We've gone five weeks in this series. So I want to conclude this series in two ways. Number one, I want to ask you, to make a personal commitment today that you will run your faith race marathon, investing all of your life to finish well the race set before you to run to the crown. So in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to do something physical to demonstrate your commitment. 
Secondly, I want to conclude this series by speaking over you a pastoral blessing. So I'm going to ask you this, this morning as we conclude the service, please come. If you're going to make that commitment, if that's you, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, just come. Put, press in. Stand close. You say, Pastor Barry, you're putting a lot of peer pressure on. I think we're going to have to stand in the face of peer pressure if we're going to survive our culture today. Anyone agree with me on that? <laughs> press in. Come on. If you're, if, you're willing, if you're willing to do that. There's plenty of room up here. Come on. Come on forward. Plenty of room. Before I pronounce a blessing over you, let me pray for you. Father God, right now in Jesus' name, I ask that you would see every person in this room who has taken a step, a tangible, physical step forward. Lord, I pray that you would acknowledge that effort and they stand at this altar, a place of consecration, a place of commitment. It's, it's an auditorium and it, there's a stage, but in this moment, for these purposes, this becomes the altar of God, a place where lives are offered in sacrifice to God. And I pray, God, that every one of these runners standing right now on the starting line, some of them halfway through their race, some of them most of the way through their race, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would give them the strength and the courage to run their race, to train, to run like there's no tomorrow, to pace themselves properly. That when we get and uh, we all stand before you, that we will not be disappointed, we'll not be ashamed. But we'll be able to look back at these moments and say, it was there that I made a commitment to run and finish well. So I ask you to bless these folks in this room today. Lord, to those who are joining us on our online campus who cannot move forward to this altar, I pray that they would stand where they are and stretch out their hands as a sign that I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Lord, you commanded Moses and Aaron to bless the people of God. And you told them what to say in that blessing. And you said, when you bless them, I will bless them. So this morning, God, I want to pray a pastoral blessing. I want to bless these con this congregation, these people gathered here online and in, per and in person. If you're here this morning and you read, just assume a posture of receiving a blessing from the Lord. Maybe lift up your hands. Maybe get ready to receive from God. And now I declare over you this priestly blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. In the marathon race of your life, as many are falling out to the left and to the right, God bless you with health and strength and conviction. May he make his face to shine upon you through the trials and hardships and unknown that we all must face with the presence of the Good Shepherd as our leader and protector through the valley of the shadow of death. May his face shine upon you as you hold fast and stand firm in your faith. May he be gracious to you as you fight for what you believe, fulfill your divine calling and face up to every challenge May he lift up his countenance upon you even when you hit a wall, when you ho your hope is waning, when you think you can't take another step. And may he give you peace, peace to hope to run on, peace to stay in the race, peace to cross the finish line and take the victor's crown, peace to rest in his victory in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen, amen, amen. Let's conclude by worshiping God. Our worship team is going to come in and lead us. You can stay for uh, this song or you can be dismissed. God bless you.